GitLab is an open core company that operates comprehensive DevOps platform of the same name, GitLab. In its core, GitLab provides Git shared central code repository for teams, but also aims to bring one workflow that connects development, security and operations team together, with the aim to build software faster. In this video, we will explore GitLab features related to continuous integration and delivery and deployment, so called the CI-CD process. We'll explain the architecture of GitLab platform and the role of GitLab runners. Then we'll go through a series of examples of building a CI-CD pipelines. We'll publish a package to GitLab building package registry. Then we'll consume the package in another project for which we'll build a Docker image and publish it to GitLab container registry. We'll also see how to publish Docker images from GitLab to the full Docker repository, Docker Hub. We'll also explore how to harden our applications with host of security features like secret detection, static application security testing and code quality checks. Then we'll see how to use GitLab's environment features to track deployments of applications from test stage all the way to production. And finally, we'll touch on some more advanced topics like how to version your deployables and images, how to support integration testing in CI-CD pipelines with libraries that themselves need to spin up Docker containers. We'll also discuss how to use GitLab services to create additional infrastructure like databases your pipeline might need for testing or other verification steps. Don't let it detract you that for some of the examples I will be using Java. Most of the tutorial is language agnostic and showcases GitLab features, so you can follow along no matter what language and build tool you use. GitLab platform is available as software as service at gitlab.com, but also has a self-managed on-premise solution. In this video, I'll be showcasing examples using SaaS offering at gitlab.com and locally installed Docker instance. I'll mention that on-premise solution offers simple integration with LDAP servers, so to log into GitLab, you may use the same credentials your users log in with to their company workstations on. Let's discuss what is the difference between GitLab, GitHub and Git. Git is distributed version control system that tracks changes in any set of computer files, and we are particularly interested in its use for coordinated work among programmers in collaboratively developing source code during software development. Distributed means that every developer can have full copy of the source code. At its core, both GitLab and GitHub provide shared central Git code repository for teams and effectively provide single source of truth when collaborating on a project. Both GitLab and GitHub use Git hooks, which is a Git feature that provides a way to fire off custom scripts when certain important actions on repository occur. Hooks can get triggered for example on commit, merge or push to a repository. So, both GitHub and GitLab in its core offer cloud-based Git repository with web-based platform. But they also offer more than that, like management and project features, and their goal is to be a single tool for your software building needs. They both offer publicly available repositories where developers across the globe can interact with and contribute to each other code in order to modify it or improve it. From this, I hope it's clear that GitLab and GitHub have a huge feature overlap, but they are both great products and if you had to choose between them, you really can't make a bad decision. As far as the differences, GitLab has free on-premise solution, so if you already have a team that works on a project, it might be a better fit. GitHub, on the other hand, has more users in its cloud-based solution, so it's used as a social platform for social coding, that is, as a networking site for developers looking to collaborate on open source projects. By the DevOps functionality it provides, GitLab can be compared to Jenkins, which is an open source automation server. Main difference between them is in the approach. GitLab focuses primarily on a Git as a version control system and has a single tool model where everything you need for your development lifecycle is integrated. Jenkins, on the other hand, has plugin infrastructure to support building, deploying and automating any project. So GitLab aims to solve entire software development lifecycle. It integrates all the software development features in a single tool. The advantage is it's easier to install, administer and upgrade than a collection of separate, more focused tools. It also requires a single set of credentials per user and offers a consistent GUI for all of its features. 
It offers a single location to plan, build, test, secure and deploy. If individual features don't give you the flexibility or power that you need, you can integrate other tools with GitLab to suit your technical needs and preferred workflow. The advantage of Jenkins is it's more versatile, with hundreds of community-developed plugins that provide pretty much every functionality you might need. However, GitLab opinionated integrated model might already provide everything you need, so you might trade the flexibility of Jenkins for the single tool mindset of GitLab. Let's talk about collaborating development workflow which begins with a version control system like Git. Version control system keeps track of code changes and enables teams to collaborate on code using shared repository, typically on central server. Even though Git is a distributed version control system, meaning everyone with Git repository can have full version of the code, central server is used as a single source of truth. It enables team reviews and approval of code. The code that was deemed ready then typically gets delivered to a series of environments, each subsequent one more similar to production. After passing required review, code finally gets delivered to customer in production. The process conceptually consists of two halves, continuous integration, which answers the question, is the code good, and continuous delivery and continuous deployment, which answers the question of where the code should go and can put it there. Continuous delivery is automatic deploying of code to the right environment, but not on the production. Human usually does that, release engineer. In continuous deployment though, everything is deployed automatically, even deploying to the production. Continuous deployment needs proven, mature, trusted CI portion of the pipeline that gives confidence that code passes tests, scans and other checks. The more you release, the more you practice, the better the pipeline gets and you release more frequently with fewer changes and less risks. The decision, should you continuously deliver or deploy, in other words, should deployment to production be done automatically, should not be a technical one, but instead should be decided by the business. In particular, main question is, how much is business process able to tolerate possible instabilities caused due to the deployment of the new versions of the software? In this process, GitLab is the central server and provides a pipeline, a blueprint for execution of tasks that would perform CI-CD process. Pipeline definition is contained in special .gitlab-ci.yaml file that becomes part of the original Git repository and as such changes to it are tracked as any other file in the project. Before we delve deep into pipelines, let's first discuss the architecture of the GitLab platform. GitLab has similar architecture to other DevOps tools like TeamCity and GitHub in that it consists of two parts. GitLab instance runs what we consider GitLab application, which is Postgres, Ruby on Rails and Vue application. So, a collection of tools, databases, queues and glue code, but as far as the user is concerned, it's a web application through which all the tasks related to project can be performed. It's responsible for storing shared Git repository as well as artifacts made during pipeline execution. GitLab runners are programs written in Go that accept CI-CD jobs from GitLab and run job tasks in an appropriate execution environment and then report results back to GitLab. The reason why CI-CD pipeline jobs are not run inside a GitLab application server directly is the diversity of possible jobs and requirements they might have. For instance, Java project would require JDK and Maven or Gradle installed, JavaScript node and NPM, Python pip, etc. Responsibility of installing some specific platform and platform versions and specific set of tools is delegated to external servers which communicate with GitLab instance over GitLab runners. The other reason is sheer amount of pipeline jobs run on software as service GitLab platform which would cause bottlenecks if they were being run on the instance itself. When we sign in to software as service platform at gitlab.com we are looking at GitLab instance and if we go to settings CI CD part we'll see the part for runners. GitLab.com provides a host of shared runners we can use out of the gate without doing anything, and we can register our own runners as well. I will not be registering custom runner on GitLab.com instance, but before we continue talking about runners in detail, I would like to demonstrate the registration process. 
I have a local instance of the GitLab and GitLab runner running in Docker and I'd like to demonstrate the process of registering a runner. We already have a GitLab runner installed on our executor machine which we can confirm by running GitLab runner dash version. And then we can run the GitLab runner register command. I've passed in a couple of additional parameters so we don't have to type them in. But this is the key part, the registration token. This is the token we have to copy from our GitLab instance and paste it into our GitLab runner to connect it to. We don't need a description. Tags are something that we can assign to a runner and later on use in a pipeline job definition to determine which runners are eligible for a given job. For our example, it's not relevant, so I'll just leave it empty. And we'll register a runner with Docker Executor. It will ask us for the default Docker image. It gives Ruby 2.7 as example, and it, Ruby's image is the default image used by the runner. We'll use Java project, so we'll say it's Maven 3.9.2. And that's it. The configuration was saved in our GitLab runner config. And if we refresh our GitLab instance, we'll see our new runner registered. Nice. I'd like to touch on the GitLab runner setup where we have picked the executor type for the runner. One of the executor types offered was shell executor, which well executes the command in the shell of the machine where GitLab runner was installed. This means that tools required for CI-CD job needs to be installed on the executor host or you need to install them with the script keyword of the pipeline job. Since all commands are executed in the host of GitLab runner, it's easy to leave leftover artifacts from past jobs, so you may not get a clean slate when using a shell executor. Other type of offered executor was VirtualBox, which requires machine with VirtualBox hypervisor installed. Runners will spin up new virtual machine from the base template, run the job in a shell session of that virtual machine, report the result back to GitLab, and then tear down the virtual machine. Parallels is another type of executor offered. It's similar as VirtualBox, but uses Parallels virtualization platform instead of VirtualBox. Another type of executor was Kubernetes. It runs a job in a pod, i.e a group of one or more containers in a Kubernetes cluster, which requires you to have a Kubernetes cluster set up on the host machine. And then we have the executor we picked, the Docker executor, which runs the job in a Docker container launched from the specific Docker image. Image can be specified in job definition globally for the whole pipeline or as a default runner executor, which we did with Maven image. After the job's done, container is then deleted. In GitLab platform, Docker is the preferred executor, as it's the most flexible executor, faster than VirtualBox or Parallels, and doesn't leave the leftover artifacts on the host machine as in case of the shell executor. It's worth pointing out that you don't have to pick one executor. If your machine has, for instance, VirtualBox and Docker installed, you can repeat the registration process with a GitLab instance and register the same host machine as, for example, shell, VirtualBox and Docker Executor. To demonstrate the features of the GitLab platform, we'll use a couple of real-life examples. In first, we'll create simple Java library and publish it to the GitLab package repository as a Maven artifact. We'll then include the artifact as a dependency in our Spring application and we'll create a Docker image from our web app. We'll publish the Docker image to the Docker Hub as well as to the GitLab built-in container registry. On GitLab Software as a Service platform, on GitLab.com, I've created a library pub subgroup and two projects in it, one for our library and the other one for our Spring Boot project. Our library only has one interesting class, UUID timestep generator, which has the static generate method, which just generates local date plus random UUID. Our Spring application currently has one REST controller that points to the root of the application and returns hello world. We'd like to replace hello world with a call to the library's generate method. We've also included the actuator dependency, which gives us the actuator health endpoint 
and if our application is correctly started and running, it should return status up. This endpoint will come in handy after we create a Docker image for our Spring Web App. We'll create a container from the published image and then hit the Actuator Health endpoint to check the status. In case you're not familiar with Maven phases, there's a couple of phases like validate, compile, test, package, verify, install, deploy. In Maven, every phase also runs every subsequent phase, so a test phase will also compile and validate the project. What's interesting for us is the test phase, which will test our applications, verify phase, which will package and run some checks on the application, and the deploy phase, which will send the final package to the remote repository. To demonstrate, we'll run Maven test on one of our projects, which will run the Surefire plugin and run our tests on the application. The results of our test will be saved into target Surefire reports directory. If we run Maven verify with minus D skip tests, this will skip tests and only create the jar. We'll start with our library and it's already uploaded to the GitLab and we configure the pipeline with a file called .gitlab-ci.yaml in the root of the repository. So let's create a new file, call it .gitlab-ci.yaml and the GitLab recognizes we want to start a new pipeline configuration and offers to apply a template for... it has a template for a variety of languages. We'll skip that for now. And for starters, we'll just manually configure our pipeline. Later down the line, we will apply a template to see what's that about. The configuration uses YAML as human readable data serialization language, and YAML uses indentation to indicate nesting. In gitlab.gitlab-ci YAML file, we'll have to use the main specific language that defines stages, jobs, and other things required for the pipeline. YAML is a popular language for configurations and other configurations as well, like GitHub, Kubernetes, etc. Stage are a collection of pipeline tasks that are thematically related, and GitLab comes with build, test and deploy stage by default. And then in stages we'll need to add tasks, and GitLab has no way of checking whether the tasks in a stage are thematically related, it's on us to keep it that way. The pipeline passes if all stages pass. So in our case, let's define test stage, which will run automated tests, and then build stage, which will package our application into JAR. Let's just start by defining stages, and then we'll commit a file, and then we'll be able to edit the file in the editor that recognizes the GitLab CI YAML syntax. So we'll create stages test and build. And we get an error message that the GitLab CI configuration is invalid. And indeed, this is the case, because in order for pipeline to be valid, it needs to have at least one stage, with at least one job, with at least one command. Let's create two jobs, one job for each of our stages. And job is just a formal name for a task that performs something, like compiling, testing or deploying. So we'll edit the file, but we'll pick edit in pipeline editor, which recognizes the GitLab CI YAML syntax. And we can create two jobs. First one will be Maven test, which will be, which will be in stage test. And then job can perform some actions in scripts, which is a list of actions. Let's say we'll just echo something, testing. And then the second job will be Maven verify, which will be in the stage build, and the script will again be something dummy for starters, echo verify. The pipeline editor has the visualize tab, and in there we can see that our pipeline has two stages, test and build. They follow each other, and the test stage for now only has Maven test job, and the build stage has Maven verify job. In the script tag, we can run commands that our executor supports. So if it's a shell executor, 
it needs to support shell commands of the host that runs the GitLab runner. And if it's the Docker executor, we can run commands depending on the Docker image we picked. We can define the default Docker image when we register our GitLab runner. We can define the default Docker image for our pipeline by defining it here on the root of the pipeline, or we can go in appropriate tasks and define it there, so it can be specific for each task. Since we are using shared runners the gitlab.com provides, we can't really define the default image of the GitLab runners, so instead we can define image on the root of our stage, because both Maven test and Maven verify job will need Maven commands. And we can use some of the Maven images. I've picked Maven 3.9.2 Alpine image, which is image with a small footprint. Having defined root Maven image on the pipeline, we can now use Maven commands in both of our jobs, because they will be constructed from the Maven image. So for our test job, we'll say maven test. And for our verify job, we'll say maven verify. And we can skip test. Tests will be run in the previous stage. And if tests fail, we won't even get to the build stage. So let's commit the pipeline and see what will happen. Pipeline failed and the reason is I've created a new gitlab.com account and I'll need to confirm it with a credit card. My card won't be charged, but the reason they need validation is because their shared runners have been really misused for various nefarious purposes. So I'll be back once I validate my account. Once I validated my account, we can go to pipelines and try to run the pipeline again. It will ask us for variables, which we don't have, so we'll just run the pipeline. And we see the pipeline starts and has two stages we defined. And first, it runs Maven test job in test stage. And only then it will run Maven verify job in the build stage. So stages are sequential. Both of our tests completed successfully, which means both of our stages completed successfully, which means pipeline passed. We can click on the individual job to get the logs of the tests that were performed. And if we go to the start, first we'll see we get the information about the shared runner that was picked for the job. And then we see that the Docker image that was used was Maven image that we defined at the root of our pipeline. After that, the environment was prepared then we were getting source from Git repository, after which the runner executed our scripts, echo testing and Maven test. Maven test required us to pull dependencies from the net needed for our project. And after the dependencies were pulled, tests were ran, they completed successfully, and that made the job succeed. Let's briefly discuss what happened during the job execution. The first part, the runner registration, we already saw. We registered with the registration token and we received confirmation from the GitLab that we were registered with the runner token. As far as the job requesting and handling part, first the runner requests a job with a runner token, signifying to GitLab that it's available to take jobs. Then the GitLab instance, when there are jobs that need to be run, sends job payload with the job token to the runner. Runner then forwards job payload to the executor, which first clones source code with a job token and then runs the job. Executor then returns job output and status to the runner, and runner communicates with the GitLab instance with the updated job output and status. What's important to notice here is that pipeline runs on contexts. It's running on some version of your project files, and it goes without saying, but the same pipeline definition can produce different results depending on the underlying code. The context isn't available just to the pipeline executors, it's available to us as well to reference in our pipeline configuration, and GitLab does that through predefined variable references. 
These are the variables we can reference in our pipeline configuration with dollar sign variable name, and they give us a variety of information, like what is the current project, what is the current branch, what is the current user running the pipeline, etc. We'll use these predefined variables in our pipeline configuration shortly. If we get back to our pipeline logs, we'll see that our test job pulled half of the internet to run tests, and in here we can drill down to the build job and have a look at the logs for it, and we'll see the similar results. And let's discuss how are these stages, build and test stage, related. If we click on the pipeline, we'll see what we saw before, that build stage comes after test stage, and only runs Maven Verify job after the test stage has completed. But how are they related? Can test stage send some artifacts to build stage, and can test or build stage send artifacts to GitLab? Let's answer those questions. First, we saw that GitLab contains pipeline configuration, which is a blueprint for stages, jobs, and commands. When there's jobs available, GitLab instance communicates it with the GitLab runner, and then the host of the runner can spin up the Docker container to execute the job. After the job is complete, the container is destroyed, and the GitLab runner reports the status of the job to the GitLab instance. When all jobs from the stage are completed, we can go to the next stage, where a similar process continues. Jobs are run in a newly created Docker container. After they are done, container is destroyed, and results are reported back to the GitLab instance. And the question is, how do we communicate between stages, and how do we communicate between jobs? And there are two ways. First is artifacts, which are files stored on the GitLab instance. Artifacts are a main way to support storing items created by our CI jobs indefinitely, as well as passing them as appendices to other CI jobs. And the second one is caching, which are items that are stored on a host where GitLab runner is installed. Caching should be thought of as a method to save items that are commonly used in CI jobs or stages. It shouldn't be thought of as a means to pass items between stages or jobs. That's the purpose of artifacts. As far as the storage, cache bundles are processed by the GitLab runner, which determines where cache will be stored, and usually it's on the machine where runner is operating, or it's on S3 storage. So, to recap, artifacts are for passing items between stages, and caching is for commonly used items. For instance, we could calculate the project version in a first stage, and then later use it in our deploy stage. For that, we would use Artifact. Another use for Artifacts might be to report test results to the GitLab instance. As for caching, a good use case in our example would be to cache Maven dependencies, so we don't have to pull them on each job. And pretty much every language has something of the similar nature, like Node packages, Ruby gems, Python modules, etc. Another difference is that caching is considered to be soft-linked, which means the job using cache will still work if a cache doesn't exist. However, a job with the artifact will not. Artifacts are considered to be hard dependencies. Another use case difference is that artifacts are considered CI job dependency, which means they are created in CI jobs and they link from one job to another while caching is considered a toolchain dependency, which means it's created and provided by third-party vendor, not by CI job, like in the case of Maven dependencies. Let's go back to our pipeline and try to incorporate artifacts and caches where appropriate in our pipeline configuration. Since artifacts are used to store data and files created during the CI pipeline execution, we can try to store JUnit tests that were created during the test phase and jar created during the build phase. We store artifacts by using the artifacts keyword and we define paths of the files that we want to store. So the jar is created at target and we can store jar by just saying star.jar. Artifacts expire in 30 days by default, so we don't need that many, we'll let it expire in one day. As far as JUnit tests are concerned, they are industry standards, so 
GitLab offers special syntax for them. And here we can say that we want to store them not only on success, but always. So on, uh, the other options are on failure, on success, and always. They can also expire in one day. And for JUnit, GitLab offers special report syntax, where we can specify report formats for tests. And JUnit is one of the options. And in here, we add path to our JUnit XML reports, which is target surefire reports in a case of Java projects. GitLab has special support for JUnit and other type of reports and will update the user interface with the report's results. We'll see that after we run the pipeline. As far as for caches, we can define a global cache for Maven repositories. And first we'll need to add Maven options configuration to let Maven know to use .maven m2 slash repository as a local repository where dependencies will be downloaded. And then we can cache this directory and let it be available for subsequent jobs. We've used global variables keyword of GitLab to define Maven options variable that will be available through the whole pipeline. We have the options of using local variables as well, let's say in jobs. We'll see example of that a little later on. Now we'll use the cache keyword to define the global cache. And we'll comment on the policy in a moment. And the cache usually has key and the path of the files we need to cache. So we know that the path needs to be .m2 repository. And for key, cache does, doesn't, have to need, doesn't have to have a key, but usually has one. We can use one of the predefined variables GitLab offers us, and it will be commit ref slug, which is the branch name lowercase and cleaned up from any special characters. This will allow us to have different caches for different branches in case we have some experimental feature branch where we want to test with some new dependencies. The policy of the cache determines whether jobs can add to cache or just retrieve the cache or both pull push. So pull is retrieve, push is add, pull push is jobs are allowed to pull and push. And we want both. We want the dependencies from tests and dependencies from verified to be one global cache. Pull push policy is default, so we may as well remove this. Let's commit our changes and see what do we get in a newly created pipeline. Our pipeline finished and one thing we notice we have a new tab for tests. This is the GitLab support for JUnit test reports and as long as we upload the artifacts for tests, it will display them in a nice user interface. Besides the JUnit tests which display how many tests were ran and how many passed, on the jobs tab we have a new download artifacts button for the second job where we uploaded the jar. So let's open the zip and we see we have a target UUID time step jar. We instructed the GitLab to cache Maven dependencies. If we go and look at the log, we'll see that since there were no cache, Maven dependencies were pulled, but on the end of the log, we see that found 708 matching artifacts and uploading cache. And if we go to the second stage, we see it's found 805 matching artifacts since our verify stage needed additional dependencies. Let's try to run the same pipeline again and see how the cache behaves on the second run. And our pipeline completed, so let's have a look at the logs. First for the test stage. And look at that, no Maven dependencies pulled. Downloaded cache zip and everything the job needed was in the cache. And as for build, same story, no Maven dependencies pulled from the internet. Nice. As a next step, we'd like to publish our library to the building package registry of the GitLab. This would allow others to consume our library. How you publish packages in a package registry depends on the appropriate technology, so you will need to reference GitLab documentation to see how it's done and the appropriate steps. As far as the Maven is concerned, we would need to create settings XML file that serves as a Maven settings file and then update our POM XML to define repositories we need to publish to. 
we see that in these files, GitLab includes GitLab predefined variables, and during the pipeline run, GitLab will actually replace these values with our custom values. So we don't have to worry about that. So we'll copy the required settings value and we'll go to our project and create CI settings XML file and paste it in. On our project, on the root, we'll create a new file, call it CI settings XML, and we'll paste in the value. And we'll do the same thing for the repository and distribution management part of our POM XML. So we'll copy it and we'll paste it in our POM XML project. We'll commit the changes and we'll push it to our repository. Our changes were pushed, our settings file is there, our POM XML is modified, and now we need to modify our pipeline configuration file to include the part which will deploy to our package repository. So we'll edit the pipeline. Let's add a new stage. Let's call it deploy. And we'll add a new job on the end Let's call it deployed to GitLab package repository. Stage will be deploy. And the script will be our Maven deploy. But we'll also give it our newly created settings file as a parameter. So it will be CI settings XML. I want to restrict when the package is being deployed to repository, only when our branch is our default branch. So we'll use a new keyword only, and we'll give it the variables of if the commit branch is equal to the default branch. This condition is the restriction on the job execution. We can also define restriction on the whole pipeline execution, which is called the workflow. So let's define a workflow restriction by using workflow keyword and we'll use the rules condition and we'll only run the pipeline if POM XML exists in a root of the directory since this is a Maven project. Otherwise it doesn't really make sense. Let's commit our changes and see what the pipeline gives us. We see our pipeline has passed and it has three stages now. If we have a look at the logs of the deploy stage, we should see uploaded to GitLab Maven and the uh, coordinates of our GitLab package registry. And if we go to the deploy part of our GitLab and look at the package registry, we see our new package created. If we drill down, we'll see the instructions of how to use the dependency in our other projects. Nice. Let's use the library in our Spring Boot project by installing the dependency and setting up the registry from the instructions. So first, we'll copy the registry setup. In our Spring Boot project, we'll paste in the distribution management for the registry and for the dependency part, and we'll also paste in the dependency part. And we can reload Maven changes to Pull the dependency in. Let's go to our application and replace the hello world part with UUID time step generator generate method. And we'll start our application just to test it out locally. After the application has started, we'll hit localhost 8080 and we see that when we refresh, we get the timestamp plus the random UUID. So the library is incorporated correctly. We'll add and commit the changes and push it to our GitLab repository. I've pushed the changes to our GitLab repository and one additional change I've made is I've added a Docker file since we plan to create Docker image from our application. Let's drill down to the Docker file. I've used multi-stage Docker file where the first stage is based on the Maven image and copies the source and the POM XML and then runs Maven clean package to create a jar. And the second stage uses the slimmed down version Java Runtime Environment Alpine image and copies from builder target jar and renames it to the app jar. And we named our first stage as builder. We are exposing 8080 port and running java-jar app jar. 
The purpose of multi-stage Docker files is to have the final image as slimmed down as possible and the first stage that runs Maven clean package would download a host of Maven dependencies in our image which we actually don't need in our final image. That's why we use multi-stage Docker file. Alternatively, we could copy the jar file from our pipeline as an artifact that's being created during the build stage, but we want the Docker file to be as independent as possible and to be able to create the image from the other environments as well. Let's go to the root of our project and create a new file for the configuration of our pipeline. And this time we will apply the template and we'll use the Maven template to see what that's about. Let's commit it. The template we've included has the Maven recommended CLI options and Maven options for the caching part and uses the cache of M2 repository as we've used in our previous example as well. We'll need to change the image because we need Java 17 and it has verify stage which basically runs Maven verify which will package the application and also uses CI commit branch equals to default branch. Only then it will package the application. It also has the deploy part we've used in the previous session. So it checks if the file CI settings XML doesn't exist outputs an error message. Otherwise it deploys to the building GitLab package repository. So we'll have to change a big part of the template, but the reason why I've included it is to show you how it's done and to show you where it's from. Building GitLab templates come from the special GitLab repository, GitLab CI templates, and this is the options we've seen when we've created our GitLab CI YAML file. It has templates for a variety of languages. Not only that, it has some security templates we'll also use. These are the templates that also a variety of languages can use. And these templates are actually available if we go to secure security configurations we can see that we can include them from here as well enabling templates from the security configuration does nothing more than to include the templates in our gitlab ci yaml file since gitlab as a platform tries to be a platform that takes care of all the stages of the development and the deployment these templates are gitlab attempt to provide additional static application security testing, dependency scanning, container scanning, secret detection, etc. by default. GitLab uses open source scanners. For instance, dependency scanning is done by open source tool called Gymnasium. But these tools are rigorously researched and vetted by GitLab before they are adopted by the scanners. We could download these scanners ourselves, but there is no need since they are integrated. And let me correct myself, they are integrated with the ultimate version. And scanners are run as Docker images and GitLab uses different scanner for different languages. If you go to the GitLab templates repository, well, let's drill down into one of these templates, SAST template, for example. And we'll see it has an artifact GL SAST report that we'll get when we include the template in our pipeline. And we'll also see it can run for different languages and it does that by checking what is the extension type in the repository. For example, this is the part for Ruby, for C, package.json, PHP, Go, etc. If we go to our security configurations, we'll see that a couple of these templates are included in, with a free version and a couple demand ultimate version of the gitlab.com subscription. So let's change our configuration, our popular configuration and include the free templates and discuss what they do. I've cleaned up our pipeline configuration. I've left recommended Maven options and added two stages for test and dockerize since we plan to create Docker image for our, from our application. And I've left the caching part. And the new thing is the inclusion of GitLab provided templates. So you include a template by using include keyword and then the special template syntax. 
This will include the templates from the this GitLab templates repository. That's the special repository. And we can also include other files. I'll show that a bit later. The templates included can be looked at at the fourth tab, full configuration. This copies the template source into our pipeline, so the GitLab knows what to run. I'll commit the changes in our pipeline and then we'll discuss what these security templates, what they do. If we look at our pipeline, we'll see that we have additional jobs being run in test stage and one in validate stage because I've placed it in the validate stage. And one important thing to notice is that vulnerabilities don't stop the pipeline. Unlike our jobs that stop the pipeline as soon as the job fails, the vulnerability scans passing only means that the scanner ran to completion. It doesn't tell you anything about whether the scanner found vulnerabilities. Instead, what you need to do is go to the pipelines and look at the artifacts this new included templates produced. These are JSON reports and determine whether you need to do something about them. If you had the ultimate subscription, you can look at the security capabilities and the GitLab will automatically include reports from these artifacts. You don't have to look at the JSON files themselves. SAS template, static application security testing, looks at bad coding practices, anti-patterns and other code smells. It looks at your project source code as opposed to interacting with your code as it runs. In that sense, it's white box scanning, as the scanner looks inside your app and inspects the code. DAST, on the other hand, is dynamic application security testing and tests web application URLs or web APIs endpoints. DAST template is available with ultimate subscription to GitLab. You feed DAST the URL and it will visit that page, identify any links or clickable elements and follow these links on repeat. It will continue spidering until it reaches every page within the app it can reach. Unlike SAST, which is white box testing, DAST is black box testing. It just sends input and looks for potential problems. Dependency scanning, it scans for third-party dependencies such as Java jars, Ruby gems, Python modules for security vulnerabilities. It parses configuration files used by package managers of each supported language, like gemfile.log for Ruby, pomxml for Maven or requirements.txt for Python. It then looks up each dependency name and version number in a database to see whether there are any known vulnerabilities in the particular version of the library. Container scanning checks for known vulnerabilities in the particular version of the Linux distributions that your project uses as a base when it builds Docker images, as well as the additional packages you might have specified in your Docker file. Secret detection looks for a wide variety of strings that represent secrets and should not normally be stored in files in Git repository. These include the likes of AWS deploy keys, GitLab personal access tokens, Heroku API keys, private SSH keys, Stripe access tokens, etc. Secret detection is based on regular expression and tries to detect and report any string literal that matches these regular expressions, its language and file agnostic. In that sense, it cannot detect passwords because well-written passwords should be difficult to detect with regular expressions. Code quality checking makes sure your project adheres to certain quality standards. Feature relies on the outside service called Cold Climate. It looks for problems like functions that take too many parameters, functions with too many exit points, functions or classes that are too long, overly complex logical expressions, duplicate code, too much or too little, vertical white space, etc. License compliance checks is software licenses of dependencies compatible with project overall license. There are other templates as well, like accessibility, browser performance or load performance testing templates. I encourage you to check the official GitLab templates repository. I'll link it in the description. Let's get back to our pipeline configuration and see what does it take to create a Docker image from our application and push it to Docker Hub as well as the built-in container registry of the gitlab.com. In order for our scripts to be able to use Docker commands, we'll no longer be able to use Maven image. Instead, we'll need to use special Docker image. If you go to Docker Hub and search for Docker, we won't find the image because searching for Docker returns every image. Instead, we can use special underscore slash Docker. And this will return 
Docker image as well as Docker in Docker image. We'll explain shortly what this means. So the latest version of the image is 2402. Let's go to our pipeline. We'll edit the pipeline in the pipeline editor and we've added the stage for Dockerize. So we'll create a new job and we'll call it push to GitLab Docker registry. Stage will be Dockerize and image will be Docker. And we saw the version was 2402. When you define images for your jobs, it's best practice to define fixed versions and not the latest, because you want the version you've tested your job and you know it works on, and you want to guard yourself from breaking changes of the future versions. As far as for scripts our job will need, we can copy three scripts provided in the instructions. So first we'll need to log in, then we'll need to build the image, and then we'll need to push it to the registry. If we want to create Docker images, this job defined as this won't work, because this image only provides Docker client. In order to push the image to the repository and to build it, we'll need also a Docker daemon. Docker daemon is a process that lets client execute Docker commands. So it's a process that lets client connect to the Docker registry, pull the image, push the image, etc. The way we provide Docker daemon in GitHub is by providing a service. That's the additional container that will run next to our job container and will provide additional services. We do that with special services keyword and we'll provide Docker 2402DIND, Docker in Docker service. So it's a service that provides a Docker daemon for the Docker client. We'll need to make sure the versions are the same. And if you go to the Docker Hub, you'll see that this Docker image is exactly what we need, Docker in Docker. So you have the client, which is 24.0, and you have the Docker in Docker service 24.0 DIND. GitLab makes sure that the containers defined in the services part are run before the container in our image part, and that they are linked, meaning that they are in the same network and that they can talk to each other. Another common use for services is if you have tests that, let's say, require infrastructure like databases. You can spin up databases in the services part and then run your tests in a script part. Let's clean up our job a little bit. Except the script tag, GitLab also offers before script and after script keywords, and we can perform some initialization in before script and clean up in after script. So let's use before script to perform the login. Another thing we have is the repetition for our image name, as well as hard-coded registry. And we can fix that by using GitLab predefined variables for registry. Registry image, registry, registry user, and registry password. So let's use predefined variable for CI registry image. Instead of this part, we'll use CI registry image. And instead of the registry name, we'll use CI registry. Docker login command defined as is won't work because we need to provide username and password, and we can use predefined variables for that as well. CI registry user, CI registry password. So we'll say that user is CI registry user, and then password is CI registry password. There is an alternative way to login by using job tokens and not registry user and registry password, but it's only available in the ultimate subscription of gitlab.com when you're using group projects. So I'll demonstrate this way on a project that's not belonging to a group in a little bit. Logging like this would result in a warning that we shouldn't directly input our password, instead we should use standard input. So we can use password standard input and remove the password we add this minus p parameter, instead we'll echo the password and feed it into our docker login command. Another thing we can do is the final rule that this job should only run if in our commit branch, so ci commit, if there exists 
Docker file. That should be it, so let's commit the changes and see the result. Our pipeline has passed and our dockerized job has finished. If we drill down into it, in the logs we should see that the push refers to repository and it seems that the image was pushed. So if we go to the deploy container registry, there's our newly created image. And we have the latest tag. Nice. And here we can copy the image path and try to create a container. Let's go to our command prompt and use docker run. We'll map port 8080 to 9999 and we can remove the image once we are done and we'll copy the registry path and we'll call, it doesn't matter what we call the container. So it says enable to find image locally and now it's pulling it from the GitLab container registry. Nice. Let's hit localhost 9999 and nice, we get the timestamp plus the random UUID. If we refresh, we get the new random UUID. Image is working correctly. Now let's get back to our pipeline and try to push our image to the Docker Hub repository as well. Our steps will be in essence similar to the job we used to push the GitLab container registry, except we'll need to change the login so that we log into Docker Hub and we'll need to change the coordinates of the image to point to the Docker Hub image. We don't want to hard code Docker Hub user and password in the scripts part of the, our pipeline configurations. So what's the alternative? When we have sensitive information that we don't want to expose in our pipeline configuration and we want to inject, GitLab offers the concepts of variables. In essence, they are similar to predefined variables, except we can define our own values. You define variables by going to the settings CICD part and there is the variables part. Firstly, I'll define a variable for my Docker Hub user. And variables have three flags you can set. The important ones are the protect variable, which means that variable is only available in the protected branches and tags. And the mask variable means that the value won't be available when you echo it in your job. Instead, you'll just see masked. The protected branches and tags you define by going to settings repository, protected branches, and in there you can define which branches or tags are protected. Currently in our repository, only main default branch is protected. To log into the Docker Hub from the GitLab from the pipeline, I won't use my password. Instead, I'll go to the account settings, to the security and generate new access token. I'll call it GitLab CI pipeline token and I'll generate. In there we have the access token and it will only be displayed once, so we'll need to copy it. And we have the instructions on how to log in. So we'll copy and close. We'll go to gitlab.com and create a new variable for our access token. Docker Hub access token. And we'll paste in the value we received and this time we'll mask the variable. With this, we are set to create a new job that will push our Docker image to the Docker Hub repository. We can basically copy our job that pushes to GitLab Docker registry and we'll say push to Docker Hub. We'll use the same stage, we'll use the same image and services, but instead of logging with CI registry password, we'll log in with Docker Hub access token. So let's replace the variables. Our password will be Docker Hub access token. Our user will be Docker Hub user. And we don't need the registry coordinates because Docker Hub is the default registry. And we can define a variable for our Docker Hub image, which will be our Docker Hub user slash CI project name and instead of using CI registry image we'll use Docker Hub image and that's it. Let's commit our changes and see the result. 
our pipeline passed and if we go to our repositories at docker hub and refresh there's our image nice after we pushed the image to the GitLab container registry, we ran the container manually from our command prompt to check whether image is correct. What we'd like to do next is do the same thing but in our pipeline. And one way we could accomplish that is to create the container after the image has been pushed to the container registry and then just curl our actuator health endpoint and check whether the status is OK. If we visualize our current pipeline, we see that the Dockerize stage has two parallel jobs. And in fact, every stage has parallel jobs until now. We'd like to now place another job in the Dockerize stage, but the job can only run after the image has been pushed. We can accomplish this by using the needs keyword. So we'll create a job that will need a push to GitLab Docker registry before it can run. So let's go to the pipeline and we'll go beneath the push to GitLab Docker registry job and create a new job. Check health of pushed image. The stage will also be Dockerize, but we'll use the keyword needs and we'll demand that the job needs the previous push to GitLab Docker registry job. The image for the job will be curl image. So curl image is curl. And our scripts will be curl something and then grab and that needs to return up, status up. Another question is what do we curl? How do we spin up the container from our image? Well, we can use the services keyword that we've used previously and we'll say that the name of the image is our CI registry image and the tag will be latest. And we can also provide an alias and we'll say app. And now we can curl HTTP app AD80 actuator health endpoint. Let me remind you that GitLab spins up services containers before it gets to the script part, so we don't have to wait for our container to start. GitLab will take care of it. If we visualize our pipeline now, we'll see that the check health of pushed image now depends on push to GitLab Docker registry job even though they run in the same stage. One more thing we can do is since this image doesn't run any Maven commands is to prevent Maven dependencies from being pulled. And we can do that by saying by setting up the dependencies to an empty array. Let's commit the changes we made to our pipeline configuration. If we go to our pipeline, we can group jobs by stage or job dependencies. And if we group them by job dependencies, we see that our check health of pushed image is after push to GitLab Docker registry. And we can show the dependencies to see this little line. And if we go to our job to check the logs, we'll see our curl to our actuator health endpoint and indeed the status was up. And we can indeed confirm that during the services startup, GitLab successfully started the container from our pushed image. There's some duplication in our pipeline configuration, and I want to explore three ways we can add reusability in CI pipelines. Let's first explore extends keyword, which is a way to reuse entire configuration block, practically providing a template configuration. Let's first move check health of pushed image underneath the push to Docker hub image so we see our pushed jobs at the same time. And they both have image docker and service docker in docker. So we can extract that into something that will be a job template. Let's extract services and image part and create a new job. The IND template. We get a warning in our pipeline configuration that the configuration is invalid because our newly added job should implement script or triggered keyword. So how can we say to the GitLab that this shouldn't be a valid job, it's just a template for other jobs? And we do that by implementing so-called hidden job, and that's just a job that has dot. 
before its name. Now that we have our DND template, we can use it in our push to GitLab Docker registry. So we'll say that this job extends our DND template. And now we can remove the image and the services part. And we can do the same thing for our Docker Hub. So the images and the services tab. And we extend from our DND template. And now if we visualize, our push jobs are still valid jobs. And if we go to our full configuration, we can see the full data for our jobs. So our push to Docker Hub, it still has image, it still has the service. It extends it from the DIND template. And the same for our push to the GitLab Docker registry. It still has the image, it still has the service. We can also extend from multiple layers. So let's demonstrate that. We'll create another template for the rules for the Docker file. So let's say this will be our Docker, Docker file template. And we'll just copy the rules part if we are on a commit branch that has a Docker file. Now we can say that our DND template extends from Docker file template. And now we can remove the rules part from our two jobs. And if you go to our full configuration, the jobs should still have the rules part extended from the second layer. So push to Docker Hub, there's the rules part. Push to GitLab Docker Registry, there's the rules part. Let's next demonstrate functionality that doesn't come from GitLab CI pipeline configuration, but it's a YAML functionality, anchors, which allows you to duplicate or inherit properties of one CI job to another. Let's anchor the curl image. So we'll copy the image part. We'll again create a hidden job. We'll call it curl anchor. And anchors are created with ant symbol. And we call it curl image. And in there we'll just paste in the image. And now instead of using this images curl image, we'll use the anchor. The syntax for referencing anchors is two less than signs, then double dots, and then asterisk, and then the anchor name. Now this will completely be replaced with this. And we can check that in our full configuration. That our check health of pushed image still has image a scroll image part. Extends keyword is similar to anchors in a way it operates, except anchors are usually used to replace duplication of the single value or couple of attributes, where extends is more used to replace entire configuration block. To be honest, I find the anchor syntax a bit confusing and personally would prefer the extends keyword. I've committed our pipeline configuration since we need to create additional file to talk about reference tags. Reference tags are custom YAML tags that are used to select keywords configuration from other CI job sections and reuse them in a current section. They are similar to anchors, but can be referenced between files. So let's create a reference tag for logging to our Docker Hub account, the before script. We'll create a new file in the root of our project. It doesn't really matter what we call it, but we'll call it Docker Hub dot gitlab ci yaml and we'll create a hidden job docker hub login and paste in the before script part let's add a double dot to correct the squiggly line and commit the changes and now we need to do two things in our main configuration. We need to include the Docker Hub GitLab CI YAML file, and we need to reference the Docker Hub login before script part. And in our main pipeline configuration, we'll go to the include part where we already included the templates GitLab provided by default. And this time we won't include the templates, but you will use a special keyword local, which means we'll include files from our local repository and we'll paste the file name, docker hub gitlab ciam. 
Besides templates and local files, we could also include remote files by using keyword remote and then providing a URL to the file. And then in our push to Docker Hub job in the before script, I'll comment what was there before. Instead of doing this, we'll use the reference and to reference, we'll use square brackets and then we need to provide the template name and then the part we want to replace and this will be the before script part. And if we check the full configuration for push to docker hub job, we'll see that we still have before script that logs into our docker hub account. We can commit our changes to complete this example project. In real world scenarios, you typically have multiple environments and you promote your code between them. You may start with test environment, then staging, and your final goal is production. As you are promoting your code, every subsequent environment should in greater extent mimic production in data set you are working with as well as the infrastructure. In GitLab, environments are represented by the name and the URL, and they can be created manually or with environment keyword inside CI-CD job. During pipeline runs, GitLab is able to track deployments to environments and even roll back to previous versions if necessary. Besides name and URL parameters which GitLab offers by default for each environment, we can have our own CI-CD custom variables like SSH key and user. The key for the variable is the same for every environment and the thing that changes is the value per environment. To demonstrate environments, I'll use local version of GitLab and I have two local Apache servers running, one on localhost 9999 which will represent production environment and one on localhost 19999 which will represent test environment. Both environments for now are serving index.html that just says it works. Let's go to the operations environments tab and define two environments. One will be production, let's call it prod and the URL will be localhost 9999. The other one will be test with the URL of localhost 19999. We can open our environments by using view deployment or going to list of environments and using this little button, open live environment. Currently, both of our environments are the same. Our pipeline configuration file GitLab CIML is currently empty and I'm going to create a simple pipeline that will copy index.html to the test environment as soon as we make any change to it and when we tag our repository this will signify that our index.html is mature enough for production and in that case we'll copy it to the production as well. In real world environments you would probably use SSH keys to connect to the appropriate environment servers, but in our case we are running local Apache servers and we are just going to copy files to the local directories. In order to do that we are going to define copy locations variables for each of our environments and they will have the same key but different values. Let's define copy location and in case of the test environment it will have this value so this is the place where you choose the environment scope and we'll create a variable of the same name it will just have prod for the copy location and the environment scope needs to be prod I've defined our GitLab CIML pipeline and let me walk you through it we only have one stage deploy in a case of deploy to test, we'll use environment test and we'll copy the HTML to the copy location. And the deploy to production is pretty much identical except the environment is production and the production only works for tags and the deploy to test works for all branches except tags. Notice we are using the same variable name, copy location, in both of our environments. The variable value will be set by consulting the environment property of the appropriate job. Let's commit our changes. And if we look at our pipeline, our deploy to test passed. And if you go to our operations environments, we'll see that we have one deploy to test. 
We trigger the pipeline by changing GitLab CIML pipeline configuration file, so the content of the test environment still looks the same. Deployment to production wasn't triggered because we didn't tag our repository, so let's change content of index.html to see the change in our test environment. Let's simply append it works too to our index.html and commit the change. Our pipeline passed, and if you go to operations environment and open the environment, we have new index.html. If we click the environment name, we'll see the deployments made to environment, and we have two deployments and one I cancelled. And in the deployments part, we have the ability to roll back the environment. So let's roll back to the previous deployment. Once the deployment has finished, we can go to the environments part and let's open the test environment and it has the previous version, it works without the two. Rollback was successful. And if we look at our deployments, we now have three deployments. Ok, let's make another change to index.html. This time we'll say it works three and commit the change. Our pipeline passed and if we open our test environment, it has the it works 3 HTML. Let's tag this version of the code. We'll say 100 message 100 and commit it. Our pipeline for tag 1000 passed, and if we go to operations environments, we now have production deployment. If we open it, it works 3. Nice. Although I've demonstrated it on a basic example, I think this is enough to give you an overview of environments and environment features in GitLab. Let's next create pipeline for a more complex Java Spring application that uses Postgres database and has integration test setup with test containers that spins up additional Docker containers for infrastructure, Postgres for database and Selenium containers for automated UI testing. We'd also like to create Docker image from the application and push it to the container registries. In our previous example of pushing Docker images to GitLab container registry, we always pushed with the latest tag, when in real world situations, you would push an image with a version tag as well. How you version and tag your artifacts depends on technology you use and project's policy. Since we are using Java project Maven build tool and Git as a version control system, we incorporated JGit for project versioning to allow automatic computation of project version based on our git branch and tag without the need to modify our POM XML. You include jgitware in your project by incorporating extensions XML file in .maven directory of your project. To get a version of our Java Maven project, we can use Maven help evaluate goal and pass it in the expression of project version. And this is the exact expression we'll use in our pipeline to get our app version and this is the version we'll tag our docker image with as well. I've already created the pipeline, so let me walk you through it. First job of the pipeline calculates project version and we are reusing the Maven expression to get our app version, assigning it to the app version variable and redirecting it to the version.env file. We'll use this file to communicate the app version with subsequent jobs in the pipeline. This means we need to pass the file as an artifact, which we do, and we include artifacts, reports and the special .env keyword. This signifies to GitLab that this file contains environment variables, and GitLab automatically reads the file in subsequent jobs, exports the variables to our script environment where they will be available for us to consume. So we don't have to read the files ourselves in subsequent jobs and extract the version. GitLab will do that automatically for us. We can just reference the variable. In my case, I only have one environment variable, app version, but you could have multiple. And we read the app version in a subsequent job that pushes Docker image to GitLab. In this case, we have additional logic. If the commit happened on the default branch, we tag our image with app version, but also the latest tag, while for other branches, we only tag it with app versions. And when we push our image, we push all the tags. So the latest plus the app version, if that was the case. Another change in this job is that we don't log in with our registry user and password. Instead, we use CI job token and special GitLab minus CI minus token user. I want to take a quick detour to talk about authenticating in GitLab. 
There are four types of tokens. Personal access token authenticates with user's permission. Project deployed token is for accessing all packages in a project and group deployed token is for accessing all packages and all projects in a group or its subgroups. Job token, which we've used, is for accessing packages in a project for which CI-CD job is defined. Unlike personal access tokens, job and deploy tokens are special kind of GitLab credentials that are not tied to a particular user, but rather serve as an alternative way to authenticate without specifying user credentials. To support integration testing with test containers, we are using additional configuration for GitLab provider by test containers. I've copied the configuration from test container site. They specify the Docker host you need to specify, Docker TLS third tier and Docker driver. If you look at the logs of one of our finished jobs that uses test with test containers, we'll see that it normally pulled Docker images. It placed them in the same network as our application and allowed them to communicate to perform tests. To briefly return to our application, when we spin up the Postgres database, we expect Postgres DB, Postgres user and Postgres password environment variables. In our Spring application, to connect to the database, we expect dburl, dburl and dbpassword environment variables. And dburl would look like jdbc postgres, then hostname, port and then schema name. We use additional job to verify that our pushed docker image starts up correctly, where we use the services to spin up Postgres database and our newly created docker image. We use variables on the job level to define Postgres DB user and password the Postgres image expects and we define alias for the container DB. We use alias of the Postgres container as a host to our dburl environment variable for our application. And we pass in the Postgres user and Postgres password as our db user and db password. In the variables we defined only for our app container. We activated container to container networking with ff network per bill equals to true. That places the services containers and the curl container in the same network so they are able to communicate with each other. We gave an alias of app to the service container that was created from our docker image and we can reference it by that name in our curl where we reference the app colon 8080 and hit our management health endpoint to check whether the status of our application is up. Another thing I'll mention is if we want to reference the app version in the services part of our job we need to include the job that created the env file and say that we need to include the artifacts as well. This needs dependency between jobs for some reason is not necessary for the scripts part but it is necessary for the services part. This verify jobs gives us the confidence that we have a properly working docker image which we can then use when deploying our app to cloud providers that support this kind of deployment. If we look at one of the pipeline runs, we'll see that the pipeline passes, pushes docker image to GitLab and Docker Hub and verifies the container's health. And if we go to Docker Hub, we'll see that our image is tagged with latest, but also the 001 snapshot tag. To conclude, GitLab is full featured CI CD platform with very logical user interface and by now has matured to support various integration and delivery flows. I personally have high opinion of the tool and would place it in the S tier list.